what is it going to take me to take for me to get that? I want to architect my life. You know, you architect your life by building a foundation, right? I call it the five steps to financial freedom. You start with learning, right? We all go to school and we learn, and then you go to earn. And when you earn, that's great, but that's not going to get you rich, as you know, right? A lot of in our country, 40% of our income almost goes to the government, depending on what state you live in. If you live in Virginia, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, then you have to, so you have to earn, what do you do with the earnings? You save, but you're never going to save your wealth, your way to wealth. You have to invest. So that's the next step. Once you invest, now you start to realize, Hey, maybe I can replace my regular income with passive income. That's the Holy grail is to kind of make money while you sleep or make money without having to exchange your time for it. You're listening to the Rich State of Mind Show, the podcast made to make you the total package in the entrepreneurial world and give you what we call a rich state of mind. If you are here looking to learn about real estate investing, marketing, elevating your business, and developing your mindset to get to the next level, then you are at the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join our community on richstateofmind.com. Now, here's your host, Anthony Ritchie. Hey, Mark, thank you so much for taking your time uh, this morning for us on the East Coast, you in Florida, me in Virginia. How's the weather out there, by the way? What part of Florida? Didn't ask. Uh, South Florida, in the Jupiter area. Okay, so close to Miami, yeah, Fort Lauderdale. Part, okay, part gotcha, just gotcha. A bit north of Miami, yeah. All right. Awesome. So uh, tell us a little bit about what you do, man. And uh, what really uh, is the reason why you wake up every day? Well, I mean, I'm a wealth architect. It's uh, it's the reason I wake up every day. I, I, I live, breathe and think about finances and and helping people get you know financial freedom all the time. And that's that's what really juices me up. So I've I run some funds. I, uh, I have some courses that teach people how to invest. And I have a mastermind group where people, we all get together on Fridays and we talk about, you know, best practices in stocks and options and how people are transforming their lives, quitting their jobs, things like that to do thing. And that, that's what really, uh, that's what really lights me up. So that's why I get out of bed every morning. All right. So we talked about earlier before we started recording how you started investing when you were 12. What yeah. got you to want to do that so early? Most kids at 12, you know, they're trying to build Legos and uh, play outside or Atari. Uh, but you were, you decided to want to invest. Uh, please tell us that. Well, I mean, I, I, my dad got me working really young, got me mowing the lawn, cleaning the pool. And then I figured I could do that with other places in the, in the neighborhood. So I started to make this money, right. I was making like five bucks a yard and, you know, three or four bucks a pool. And that was big money back then. Right. And I started to add that up. And then I really loved my dad. My dad was like my mentor. He was like my hero. And every day uh, when he would get, you know, home from work, he would be sitting on the table reading the Wall Street Journal. And he was circling stocks. And, and finally, I was like, what are you doing, dad? And he said, well, this is a stock market. And he started to teach me about the market. And when I was about 12, we took, uh, I think it was 300 bucks. And I invested in 100 shares of a stock called Aileen, which was a woman's clothing store that I really never heard of, actually. Okay. But it fit all the criteria that my dad you know, taught me. And the stock went from from uh, three bucks to six bucks, so it doubled, right? So I was okay. like, "Woohoo, this is cool!" Like I was a kid, I, was, I just doubled my money, and then I put my money into um, a stock called Allegheny Airlines, which became U.S. Airways, and it went from like seventeen to thirty-five. So I doubled it again. So it's kind of like the drive that you hit when you go to the golf course. If you hit one down the middle, you're hooked, right? Even though the next nine go into the woods. So I was like, this is really cool. I, you know, I can use my money to make money. So I learned that lesson early on and I've been investing ever since, you know, I've had brokerage firms and hedge funds and, and, um, you know, help people and I've been a customer. Right. And then I, I've helped people invest along the way, you know, pretty much all my life. It's been and so you, you got to the point where you retired quotations uh, at the age of 39, what, what, so retirement to you, is that like you had a freedom number, you had a certain amount of money you wanted to make every month or a year in order to say, hey, I can now find this is my financial freedom. That's an interesting question, because that's really what kind of formulated what I do now is that I didn't really have a number. I sold my I had a Wall Street company that did financial technology. We were kind of the precursors to the electronic trading boom that's going on today. 
and sold that company to a big Wall Street bank um, in, in 2006, 2005, 2006 in that area. And I was like, okay, cool. I can go play golf now. But there's no fulfillment for me in golf, right? So I was working really hard and I got my golf score down and I'm like, okay, now what is there? And so I started other companies and started other funds, investing for other people, things like that. And so there was no number, but you know what? I wish I had a number. I wish I had something to shoot for, something, not just a number. It's what the number does for you. It's how you translate that number into a lifestyle, right? right? For me, it's about traveling. I've been to 56 countries and I got 44 left and, um, and I want to go explore and I want to you know, meet new people and experience new cultures. So that's what it is for me. Everybody's got their own number, but that number, the money, it's not about the money. We think it's about the money. It's about what the money can do for you and your freedom, your lifestyle and you know, what it can give you. No, I, I love the fact that you brought that up because um, I've talked about this several times where yeah. uh, money is just a tool. It is. Right. But it's what we do with it that matters. And I think we, we all get kind of excited, like, OK, I can make, you know, if I can make a million dollars, you know, what would I do with it? You know, we always had, had those fantasy moments. We're just sitting thinking about right. what we could do. And uh, it's it's kind of it's kind of uh, like an ecstasy feeling when you you get to a particular milestone and then you're like, whoa, I, I made it. I'm here. I, this hard work paid off time and consistency pay, consistency paid off and it, it sounds like that's what you did over time you you I mean you started when you were 12 and throughout your years you learned and studied your craft and got better and better and I like the word the, the term wealth architect I've never heard of that term before um, is what all does that entail well, you want the long version or the short version? We'll do, we'll, do the, we'll do the long version. It's fine. Yeah. Well, the long version is this. You know, we go to school and in school, there are very few schools teach us about money. Right. And, you know, but I don't know about you, but I use money every day. I buy stuff. I sell stuff. I use it every day. But yet, I, don't, you know, I wasn't taught about it. So, I, you know, it became an elective. Like it becomes an elective in our lives. And then we're not taught properly. It depends on who, it depends on the mentors we choose to, to educate us about it. Right. So why aren't we taught? money like we're taught about romeo and juliet we're and we're taught about the pythagorean theorem and we're taught all this algebra but like take a semester and teach us a little bit about how to buy a house or how to invest or compounded interest or some of these things that we're going to need for the rest of our lives so i started to realize that most people don't really have a full grasp of it and being a financial planner financial advisor running a brokerage firm all that stuff gave me some interesting insight on it and so if people just would sit down once a year, maybe four times a year if they can, but just think about what they want. And then that's the Stephen Covey begin with the end in mind and then back up from that and go, OK, what is it going to take me to take for me to get that? I want to architect my life. You know, you architect your life by building a foundation. Right. And I call it the five steps to financial freedom. You start with learning. Right. We all go to school and we learn and then you go to earn. And when you earn, that's great, but that's not going to get you rich, as you know, right? A lot of in our country, 40% of our income almost goes to the government, depending on what state you live in. If you live in Virginia, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, then you have to, so you have to earn. What do you do with the earnings? You save, but you're never going to save your wealth, your way to wealth. You have to invest. So that's the next step. Once you invest, now you start to realize hey, maybe I can replace my regular income with passive income. That's the holy grail is to kind of make money while you sleep or make money without having to exchange your time for it, right? And so as we get older and as I've gotten older, I've realized, you know, the money keeps coming in because I've created all these streams of passive income. So that's what really has to happen in those first few steps. And then you protect your money and then you contribute back um, as much as you possibly can give back to the people that, that helped you and give back to society that, that needs the help. And good that you brought up passive income because you talk about creating passive income in the stock market. I think the most talked about passive income right now is real estate. That's usually the co most common thing people usually hear, sure. uh, probably if you typed in Google, but passive income in the stock market. Um, I got exposed to that for the first time. I had a kid that uh, he inherited some stocks. And I don't know if he was exaggerating, but his passive, well, based off his dividends, he was making 60 grand a year, which is a lot of money in stocks if your dividends equal that. And so uh, could you please kind of break down how can somebody uh, create passive income off of uh, stocks? 
from, from your sure uh, yeah i mean and and just to back up a little bit you know real estate is a great way and it's the most common way to to passive income because they've got a good corner on the market and there's a lot of tax reasons that the government gives you to do it right they give you depreciation appreciation phantom income a lot of incentives you know even mortgage deductions but there's other ways too like you can have an amazon store that all of a sudden churns things out you can write a book you can record a song there's lots of ways to make passive income i like the stock market because i know it really well i love the fact that you can get in and out of a stock with a click of a mouse that's also a double-edged sword because a lot of people make mistakes because they don't know what they're doing it's too easy to click that mouse and spend a hundred thousand dollars and and then not have a strategy right that's the problem but you can do it with dividends for sure. But you need to have dividends that pay like 6%. If you got a million bucks to make that 60,000, that's, there's not a lot of instruments out there that are paying 60% the, or 6% these days. Most instruments, even treasuries, the safest ones are paying around 2%. So you've got to use uh, the stock market and vehicles to create passive income. Now, it's interesting you brought it up as a real estate kind of thing, because that's what we do. We basically own a stock and we rent it out to people that want to pay us for the right to do something. So it's like owning an Airbnb and people pay you rent. So we collect rent on our stocks every week or every month. And that's how we make about two to four percent. That's what our target is. And we frequently overshoot it. So. And uh, you called it the boring way. Is this the uh, <laughs> financial freedom? Is this what they call call option? Is that yeah, so it's a it's a covered call strategy, but it's it's more than you can go to YouTube and put in covered call and you can get a zillion free videos on covered calls. Okay. They're all out there and a lot of them are pretty good. But there's nobody out there that I've seen that builds a full strategy around it. And in any kind of trading, in any kind of investing, really, or anything you do in life, you got to have a system, you got to have a strategy, right? You don't just you don't just start a podcast and go, hey, I'm going to see what happens. Like you have a strategy. I know you have a business plan. Yeah. And so it's the same thing uh, by doing this in the market. So what we do is we we find an asset like Tesla stock, for example, and then we'll sell somebody else the right to buy our Tesla at a predetermined price before a predetermined date. And generally, we shoot, we, we urge our investors to try to make between two and 4% a month. If you overshoot that, you're probably a little bit on the risky side. And if you undershoot it, well, you know, you're, you're really safe, but you're not making a lot of headway. And so we rent out our stocks to other people. So it's kind of like real estate. We just happen to use stocks as the base. Now, why on the other end would I do that? Why would I rent out somebody somebody's stock? So it's an option. So an option, if you... Um, so let's say that uh, across the street from you um, is a building, is a, is, a, is a vacant lot, but you heard that somebody's going to be putting a, a, a huge hotel right next to that vacant lot, right? So that makes the vacant lot worth a lot more, but you don't have the money to buy that vacant lot. Let's say they want $100,000 for the lot. You only got, say, 10 grand. So you go to the guy with the lot because you have this information in your head, you think, right? And so you go, hey, listen, can I give you $10,000? You sell me your property for 100,000? And he goes, well, I got it on the market for 100,000 right now. Uh, and you say, I can't afford it, but give me six months to come up with the money, but I'll give you $10,000 to take it off the market. So if the hotel gets built, now all of a sudden your property might go from 100,000 to say 200,000 and your $10,000 basically turned into $200,000. So it's a lot of leverage. So you're willing to do that because of the chance that it goes up in value by a huge amount. That's what an option is. But the guy that owns the lot, he gets your 10 grand, whether they build the hotel next to him or not. Yeah. And so since information is imperfect, you won't know really if they build the hotel or not. You think you, you think, you know, you might have a rumor that you're trading on, but he always collects that $10,000 on a vacant lot that he was willing to sell for a hundred thousand. Anyway, that's why you would do it. Cause you're the gambler, but you know, there's on the other side of the gambler is the house, right? Yes. Those big casinos are built in Las Vegas, not on the winners, but they're built on the people that are willing to lose that money. You know, when you go to Vegas, you go, well, I'm only willing to lose $500 and then I'm walking away, right? That's what a lot of people say. It's the worst strategy ever for Las Vegas because you're going to lose the 500 and they're going to put up, an, you know, a, 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 another building in, in Las Vegas. So the risk taker normally loses. 80% of all options expire with no value. But that means on the other side, the seller, the person that gets the money for the option, flip it around. That means 80% of the time there's value in the option for them because they sold it. So they got the money for it. And you always keep the money that you get when you sell something. The house always wins. Yes. Even awesome. though it's a small percentage, you win. That's the two to 4% a month. And that's with the, 
the call option how many shares what's the minimum shares it's like 100 shares yeah it's 100 shares is one call you know one stock option one call there's calls and puts puts are for if you're betting everything goes down if you, we start talking about puts people's brains explode because <laughs> people don't like to look at the negative side you can make money on that side too but calls are for you know you want things to go up so you buy a call option you know you might buy a call option on a apple stock right now for two dollars gives you the right to buy apple at 165 and Apple's at 163. So you might pay $2 for the next week to have the option to buy it at 165. If it goes 168, you end up making an extra dollar on that investment because it goes up $3 over the value that you bought it for. Gotcha. And so sense. like we talked about before, so recording, you know, the biggest, I would say in the last 18 months, the biggest uh, hype has been cryptocurrency. Oh yeah. Even though Bitcoin has been around for over ten years, and I know everybody wishes that's listened to this podcast wishes they bought when it bought it when it was a dollar. Um, but what's your take on cryptocurrency? It's, it's volatility, uh, the ability to make money off of that. What's your what's your take on that? Well, it's it's a I I could do a couple hours on this, so I'm going to try to boil it down into a few bullet points. First of all, cryptocurrency for those that don't know what it is, it's really a new form of money. And when you ask about what is money, well, money has a lot of characteristics, divisibility, portability, recognizability, um, you know, you have to be able to accept it, it's, you know, it's divided, um, and then it's a store of value, and it's an exchange medium, right? So right now, cryptocurrency, most of them <clears throat> are not quite exchange mediums yet, but they're being adopted at a rate faster than the internet was adopted. And we all wish that we'd bought, you know, internet stocks, Apple, Amazon, way back when, when the internet was being adopted. This is that disruptive technology that we're going to wish we owned 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. It's the only perfect money there is, right? And it's based on supply and demand. Now, I had all these objections about cryptocurrency before I got in it. Like, can it be hacked? And the government's going to come and take it. And all these things that everybody thinks the same. And I went and did my diligence. And at the end of the day, it's based on the network effect. And the network effect, Metcalf's law says that the more nodes on a network, the more valuable the network becomes. So if you and I have Facebook on our phone, but nobody else in the world has it, well, it ain't worth that much, right? But if five people have it, have it it's worth a little bit more. You can share some pictures. But if five billion people have Facebook, that's why you get a valuation that Facebook has, you know, around a trillion dollars, because it's that number of nodes, the number of uses on it. And now there's a payment network underneath uh, Bitcoin that allows people to, to do payments. So one interesting case study is the country of El Salvador. Now you might go, poor country in Central America, what do they have to lose? But they were using the dollar as their currency. And they're watching us print money. We've printed 40% more money. We printed more money in the last year, which is about 40% of the money we've ever printed, than we've printed in the, in the last 100 years. So we're debasing our currency. And if you know anything about supply and demand, the more that some something increases in supply, the less value it has, right? If you and I are out at a restaurant and we're having a bottle of wine and it's a $200 bottle of wine, we might go, oh, this is really good. And we might say, let's get another one, man. Let's get another one. And the second one, we go, this is really good. But on that fifth or sixth or 10th or 20th bottle of wine, we're not going to pay 200 bucks for it because the utility that it has for us, because there are so many of them, we're not willing to pay the 200 bucks. So the value exactly. of it declines the more of, the more that there is. And so that's, I think, what's, what Bitcoin is about. So don't look at Bitcoin as a new money yet. And don't look at it like it has to replace old money. I think the dollar stands. Some cryptocurrencies are going to stand. Some are going to fail. Bitcoin is one that's only got 21 million that are ever going to be made. There are already about 18.6 million out there that have been made. Once the 21 million get made, and that won't happen for another 100 years, so very few are being made, the value is inherent. There can't be any more Bitcoin made. You can always make more gold. You can always make lots more dollars, and that's what they're doing. So the value of them declines. There's never been a fiat currency, a currency created by the government, that's ever succeeded in the history of humans. And we're going down that same path. Bitcoin is, I think, going to be a big winner. And so when you... It makes me think about people that say, hey, you know, Bitcoin could be worth 100,000 or up to 500,000 one day because the fact that there's only a certain amount of them left. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, you know what? 
here's what did it for me, Anthony, is when, is when I looked six, six years ago in 2016, it took 480 Bitcoin to buy the average home, right? Okay. Today, it takes seven or eight, right? And so when you start to price things in Bitcoin, you realize how much we're devaluing the dollar. So yes, it'll go to 100,000, but not because it's got so much more value, but, become, but because the thing, the denominator becomes worth less. And so it will become worth more in terms of dollars, but you can still buy a lot with Bitcoin, especially the more that people come in, countries adopt it, uh, companies adopt it, and now institutions are starting to adopt it. And so that the more people adopt it, the more demand there is going to drive the price up. And we got a little break in it right now, right? It just went down 12% in the last week, and it's been down about 36% from its high in the last two and a half months. So you're getting an opportunity to buy it cheaper. And you know that's when people don't like to buy is when things are going down. But in this case, I really believe that there's a lot of value in it. I don't know what the value is. Uh, from a dollar perspective, I can just tell you that long-term, I believe there's a huge amount of value. And we'll look back on this five, 10 years from now, and go, God, I had the opportunity to buy Bitcoin and I didn't do it. Yeah, even now, I guess people, because I remember when it went up to 11,000 and people were like, that's probably the highest. And go 11,000 and 18,000. Yep. And then it just shot off to 60,000 plus. And yep. uh, then now everybody's like, well, it's too expensive now. But would you say it's still beneficial? Let's say I have $1,000 to still just put $1,000 into Bitcoin. Well, if, if not as an investment, Anthony, if you just if you just want to learn about something, you got to put your money in it, right? It's one thing to read an article or hear a podcast. It's another thing to actually put your money in. You really get your emotions in it. Yeah. So put a hundred bucks in it. Figure out how to buy it. Put a hundred dollars. When you got a hundred dollars in it, you're going to start following it. You will be educated, and that's all I'm about. Is about you know giving people options to learn about things. And that's one way you got to figure out how to open up an account, Coinbase or Robinhood or whatever you want to use. There's a lot of places you can buy Bitcoin, but going through that process, taking a couple of hours, take, you know, skipping that Netflix movie and figuring out how to get into cryptocurrency will probably pay off in spades five to 10 years from now. Just amazingly. And I love the fact that you talked about uh, the value of the dollar. And how it is going down in comparison to you know cryptocurrency, how that it's not necessarily that the value of that's going up, it's just how much money we're printing out. And there's been a lot of talk. You talked about how how much money we just printed out this past year, right? To keep everything in play. Because I thought we were ready and destined for a depression. Not a depression, I mean recession. <laughs> not a depression. <laughs> be either one. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah that would be horrible so uh i thought we were that was going to happen but it looks like we just kept getting bought you know bought out like hey trying to sustain the market but i i understand that you know recessions or, or you know breaks in the you know or corrections are healthy for the market even with real estate i understand for me i was expecting my properties to go down but they actually shot up like like 60 percent. so i was like all right well i'll sell because okay. this is going to be this is at its high point and i'm going to take this and turn to something else uh so it's a, it's a little not that we are we are able to on point predict statistics will show us like hey this is kind of where it's going but it's a little sometimes it's a little unsettling when it goes in a direction that nobody kind of saw it going how can how can you from from your experience in situations like this where these are kind of unprecedented times because of the pandemic and how the market has still, you know, prospered. How can people still, uh, I guess, keep their sanity while still making their safe two to four percent through uncertain times? Well, I think you have to start with mindset. Mindset, I always tell my investors, is 90% of your investing, right? If you invest with emotions, it's a, it's emotions are the enemy of the trader, the investor. So emotions go up, intelligence goes down. That's, that's generally what happened and vice versa. So you want to keep your emotions out of it by having a plan and keeping a really cool mindset. And, you know, keeping a cool mindset means you know where you're going. And that helps you keep your eye on the target. But then you start to just kind of learn, right? Like we're not, most of us don't spend a lot of time watching the financial markets, learning about them. And then nobody, even you get two economists on CNBC, you're going to get five opinions. So nobody, even the smartest guys from Yale and Harvard have opposite opinions about where it's going. So the thing is that you need to educate yourself about where you think it's going. You made a decision about your home based on your life. 
and what you thought the market was at. I can't predict whether the market's going to go up or down or sideways or for how long or when. I just believe that there's trends. And for the last 12 years, the government's been printing this money, right? They, we had this gigantic hole in the ground that we created in 2007 and eight, right? All these mortgage defaults. Mm -hmm. And we bailed out the banks, right? All the taxpayers, we bailed all these guys out. And we filled in that hole. And then we kept, we kept putting dirt on top of the hole. So now the mound has gotten so big that now they're like, okay, where are we going to put all this dirt? And they've given it out to everybody. So everybody's got this money sloshing around, you know, raises are happening. Um, and then you're seeing this incredible inflation. I don't know about you, but, you know, my chicken's gone up 30%. My gas has gone up 50%. Mm -hmm. You know, my airline tickets, things are going up because people have more money to spend, but their wages aren't going up in, in this at the same rate. So if, I think inflation is about 20% because we've printed about 20, 25%, almost 30% of money in the last year. So coincidentally, inflation is going up. I don't think it's going away. I don't care what the politicians tell us. I think it's here to stay. And so you have to stay ahead of inflation. And so that's why they tell you that inflation is the tax on the poor because the poor don't have extra money to put it in houses and stocks, right? Those things are going to go up because they're going to be inflated up. Houses, real estate, um, you know, stocks, gold, other assets, Bitcoin. And then people that can't afford to do any of that, they're just trying to make ends meet. They have to buy their eggs. They have to buy their chicken. And they don't have any extra money. And they're the ones that are getting taxed the most. We're all getting taxed, but some of us can afford it a bit more than others. And so knowing that that's coming helps you hopefully be able to prepare against it or prepare for it, I should say. No. And so you, you actually made me think it's even more, even more essential that you do invest because at least that wave you can ride as yeah. things cost more, your assets will increase. Um, maybe if you have a day job, you know, if let's say you're a teacher or a military like me, where I have my base pay grade amount and I only get an increase every year. And it's usually like 2%, depending who's in office. Right. 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 And, um, but I have no major control. I could work 80 hours this week and I could work 20 next week and I, my paycheck would still be the same. Mm -hmm. But with this, you have control uh, over how much you will make and you to not be to be a positively affected when inflation does happen. So, yeah, that is that is good. I'm glad you brought that up. So and on that, I think everybody has an opportunity to look at their life and say, am I using this opportunity, because this is an opportunity with inflation, with Bitcoin, with we've never had the opportunities that we have right now. You can get online and you can start a business in five minutes with the phone, right? Yeah, you could. And there's influencers and there's ways you can sell stuff on Amazon. I mean, there's a zillion different ways. What are you doing with your time? Are you spending it, you know, making TikTok videos? Maybe you are and you're an influencer on TikTok and that's bringing you into some side hustle. Or are you spending it, you know, building a, a, writing a book or doing something where you can get that marginal income so that you can invest so you can stay ahead of inflation? Or are you just happy living your life the way it is? And if you are, that's fine. But know that you're making a choice about the future when you do that with your time. Uh, you talked about uh, Wall Street, and I want to make sure I'm saying this word right. Wall Street's axioms, A-X-I-O-M-S. Yeah, axioms. Yeah. Axioms. Yeah. Hold, holding back our investments. What is that? I didn't even know what that oh, word man. was. Saying a lot. Well, like if you if you listen to Wall Street, again, Wall Street has their own interests in mind. And I used to be on Wall Street. I understand the concept. And Wall Street's job is to gather your assets. So you know you got you got a million bucks or a hundred thousand bucks or even ten thousand bucks. They're coming after it. They want to put it in their portfolio, and they want to charge you for it. So that's their job is to grab your assets and get them under management because they make money on your money. Okay, everybody's allowed to make money on their money. But the way they do it is really interesting. They tell you, oh, just put your money in savings, right? So if let's, let's do the math on savings, okay? If you go to the bank, I'm going to be generous, but if you put your money in a CD, a certificate of deposit, you take $100,000 and you put it in the CD, they may pay you a half a percent. They may pay you a half. That's $500 on $100,000. Okay. First of all, you got to pay tax on that $500. So take a third of it or 25% of off, whatever. So now that, that, um, that $500 that you're left with 350, let's call it, or maybe even a little bit less, but 350. But we just decided that inflation, we, you know, I know inflation's at 20%, at least for me. 
and the government might tell you it's seven, but I don't know what they're what they're buying. I could tell you everything I own or I'm buying is more than seven percent higher than it was last year. And so if you're only making a half a percent in income, but the government is, you know, not the government, but the inflation rate is 20 percent, you're actually losing money. So they tell you the safest way to invest is to save your money in the safe certificate of deposit that you get at your bank. And the banks make you feel good because they got these pretty little buildings and all that stuff. But that's a guaranteed loss. To me, that's, that's like the unsafest thing that you can do is put your money in something and knowing you're going to lose purchasing power a year from now. In other words, my 100 bucks today is only going to be able to buy $80 worth of goods in a year. That's a guaranteed loss. So that's one. The other one is diversify. So Wall Street will tell you, well, you got to put your portfolio in a diversified uh, funds and a portfolio of ETFs and mutual funds and a few good stocks and, you know, whatever. And they tell you that diversification is key. And the, the, the way they sell it to you is that, well, if gold goes up, then the stock market usually goes down. Or if bonds go up, the stock market goes down. So you're kind of hedging your risks all along the way. With that strategy, and I don't disagree with diversification, I'll tell you about that in a second. But with that strategy, all you're doing is creating average. You're just creating an average return. Average return in the markets with all of those kind of assets is 5%, 4%, something like that. And we just talked about inflation being 20. So why would you want to even invest for 4%? I'm not saying you need to go out and invest for 100%. I'm just saying you need to be aware of what's happening to your purchasing power. So I did a study a few years ago about the S&P 500, which is the Standard & Poor's 500 stocks that you know about, right? Coca-Cola, IBM, Apple, Tesla, Google, they're all lumped into this index of 500 stocks. The problem with 500 stocks is you got a bunch of good ones and you got a bunch of crappy ones and you got a bunch of average ones in the middle, right? So when you when I did this study, the S&P 500 in a two-year period had increased about 28.5% over that two-year period. Yeah, Pretty good, right? But the top 10 stocks in that two-year period increased 185%. So if you can get rid of the other 490 stocks and just find a few of the top 10, you're going to have a performance that's way higher than the S&P 500. Now, the key is how do you find those? You know, you know which ones they are. They're the Apples, the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, you know, the ones that have outperformed. And looking back, we can find them. We teach people how to, you know, get probabilities on their side to find them. So here's what I will say. Diversify. Diversification is not the bad thing, but diversify among asset classes, but concentrate within asset classes. One of my mentors is William O'Neill. William O'Neill is the second greatest trader of all time, I believe. And he's, uh, he's founded Investors Business Daily and some of the products that I use to help my investors, he's created them. And he did the study of the last hundred years. And he says, if you're not making 40% in the market, you're doing something wrong. And I agree with him. And so he says, even if you got a million dollar portfolio, you shouldn't have more than three or four stocks in there. Now, I know that doesn't sound right to most yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to diversify. You got to have 500. You got to have ETFs. But the, the thing is, like, that's shooting for average. That's the other thing that Wall Street does. They don't want to get sued. They won't get sued if you get an average return because they go, judge, he did average. Like, he got the, the rest of the market made 9%. He made 8%. That's pretty good judge throws the case out, right? So, but they do strategies with their money that is totally different than what they do with your money. So I don't wake up in the morning going, oh, I want to be average today. I want to be awesome. I want to be excellent, right? So if you want to be awesome, actually, you have to find the excellent investments. You have to have the excellent strategies and you have to, you have to be financially educated to do all that too. So it's important. I love the similarity in the stock markets of uh, real estate. I had a yeah. deal presented to me that was a 10 year deal. Um, but I didn't want to have my 50 grand locked up for 10 years. And you, I get interest yeah. on it. I get eight to 10% on it. And then I get double back, double right. my money back in 10 years. Uh, but I was like, I could do more than eight to 10% in like three years. I could, or, you know, uh, I, I, not to say that that deal is average. It's the, the rule of thumb I've heard is that if you double your investment in 10 years, it was a good investment. Um, yeah. But I feel like I, we, I could do more. And it's good to hear that in other spaces, you can do that as well, but you have to yeah. do your education. And so what people, yeah. you brought up about the ETFs, the uh, S&P uh, 500, where it's simple. I dump it in there. I know over time it's going to do my 8 to 10%, right? 
not much education I have to do on it. I just heard it's going to do well and it's better than just having in, in a half of a percent. Uh, but when you do the education, you be 40 percent. Yeah. 60 percent. And that's what I do like to do with my the real estate stuff. I can shoot for 40, 60 percent and get it. But I ha- it's a heavy lift. You got to be willing to do the work, do the research. And that is the difference between, I guess, people that, you know, make decent returns and the people that are like, hey, man, I did all of this. And it's not scheming and scamming. It's just really understanding the market, understanding what your your asset class and maximizing the profits out of it. Bingo. You know, we don't know. A lot of times we don't know what we don't know, right? It's that unconscious incompetent stage that if we're not taught about money, if we're not interested in money, we don't know all the different ways there are. We hear stories about Bitcoin and boy, we'd have, we wish we'd have bought it 10 years ago. But there's a lot of ways to make money without having to buy this one asset that happened to just be incredible. You can make money consistently. I was challenged a couple of years ago, Anthony, um, because I have this program that I tell people they make they make two to four percent. Now, between you and me and your audience, it's an undersell, right? And so people say, well, this sounds scammy. And I went, okay, maybe it does. And I've been hearing that all my life. And I thought the same thing when I first got into it. Like, it's too good to be true. Why doesn't everybody do it? And once you realize that Wall Street does it, Warren Buffett does it, a lot of people do it, you just don't know about it. Then you start to open your eyes and go, wait a minute, maybe there's something I can learn. So I took this, I have one, of, I have an IRA at Schwab. And so I took this IRA, it had $111,820 in it at the time. And I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge myself and I'm going to prove it to you guys that I can make money on this, on this $111,820. So I started on April 30th of 2020. And, you know, it made 12% the first month, the second month it made 24, and then it was at 36% by the third month. And it was making about 12% a month for a while. And then it went to the end of that period of time and it doubled six months. In six months, it doubled. Then it went down a little bit here and there. Um, and then I just I just did the last report on this account. Now, I didn't add any money to the account. I didn't subtract any money to the account. I only traded two stocks in the account, Netflix and Tesla. And there's only Tesla in there now. And I use the option strategies that I teach. And I don't even like to tell people this because they don't believe it, but it's true. It's documented. It's on my website. The account is now worth 500, and I think it was on Friday, it's $568,000. And I didn't do anything special. I just did this strategy and the account's up almost five, five times. So if you can learn, and I'm not saying that's typical. I'm saying that if you use my strategy, it may or may not work, but it worked for me and I proved it. And a lot of people go, well, yeah, well, you had a market that was going up. Yeah, okay, I did. And you had a stock that was going up. But I didn't know it was going to go up at that time. When I did it, I just said, I'm going to do it. And it went up. And, you know, we use option strategies in ways that we do. But, you know, you don't have to go that aggressive. Um, but it works. So if you, if you start to realize that you don't know what you don't know, and you get yourself educated about real estate, about Bitcoin, about the stock market, about the options market, about whatever, you know, selling on Amazon. Yeah. You can start to take advantage of that American dream. That's out there for you. What's the minimum you recommend people start with to start investing? I think you need to start where you're at. I mean, if you, like I said, with the Bitcoin, you know, if you got a hundred bucks, put it in a Bitcoin. You, you okay. don't have to buy a full Bitcoin for, I think it's now 35,000, 36,000. Oh, wow. It really went that Yeah, it really now. dropped. You know, it's yeah. 69, almost 69. I bought so, some at like 41. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> I buy it all the way up. I buy it all the way down. It doesn't really matter what I buy it at because I think the 10 years from now, it doesn't, you're, I always tell people, listen, don't invest more money that if it goes to zero, because it could. If it goes to zero, that you you know that it's going to change your life, but invest enough money that if it goes to a million or wherever it might go, four hundred thousand, a hundred thousand, it's going to change your life, right? Fair so enough. there's that sweet spot. I like to tell people, you know, use it like a digital gold. If you're going to invest some of your money in gold, take some of it and put it in Bitcoin, just a little bit, not enough to you know kill you, but if it does what I think it's going to do. It's going to be really good. So to answer your question about the stock market, start where you are. Most accounts, E-Trade, Ameritrade, um, you know, Schwab, they require a couple thousand dollars to, to put your to start with your money. And just that'll help you get educated. There's paper trading accounts, which I'm not a big believer in because you don't have your emotions in it. 
but start right where you are and start start you know getting educated and have a system have a plan and that will help you uh, help you make a lot of money Awesome. In our Thank program, you. we recommend one hundred and fifty thousand, but you know, not not everybody qualifies. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't start doing something. Thank you. Thank you so much for breaking this down. Uh, anybody that I feel like didn't know much about stocks, I think you've definitely broke it down in a way that it's like, okay, I, I understand enough to not feel so completely intimidated by this concept, and yeah. so maybe I should learn a little bit more of it outside of just Dogecoin or Bitcoin and just really understand <laughs> exactly. the market. Um, yeah. because there's, there's money to be made, uh, not only, you know, let's just say for people that maybe want to income off of it, but maybe just a, a nice nest egg, a nice savings, something to pass down to the, to the family, to their kids, stuff like that. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure. Uh, and I always tell people timing is a lot of it. We always say buy the rights. And this is for your audience. This doesn't mean they have to you know hang out with me, but if, if, if they do, they're going to hear this a lot. You buy the right stock in the right market. So the market is critical. Right now, we've had a decline in the market of like 12% in the last three weeks of 2021, right? So you buy the right stock in the right market, and then you got to find the right spot on the chart where there's the highest probabilities. And then you optimize. You have to realize that stocks go down and stocks go up. So you got to take your losses and keep them small, and then you ride those ones so you can get those apples and those Facebooks over time as they continue to go up. But it's, it's all of those things that create a system. So whatever the system is for you, don't just go, well... I like this Zoom stock, so I'm going to go out and buy Zoom stock because everybody's using Zoom. Learn about it. Find out about market timing. Find out about what makes that company so awesome or whatever company it's going to be for you. I'm, you know, I can't give you financial advice, but yes. get involved in it, buy a share of it, and then you'll, you'll really understand it. You made me think about Peloton. The Peloton stock was worth a yeah. lot. Um, yeah. And then now it's like maybe $25, something crazy. Yeah, that's it was right. worth over 1000 yeah, it shot way up. And, you know, the thing is, you know, I never I never bought a share of Peloton, never sold a share, but I, I never got it. Like, that's another thing is invest in what you know. But I was like, wait a minute, this is a bike. <laughs> wait, oh, wait a minute, you can put a YouTube video on and your bicycle just lift the back wheel off the floor and you got a Peloton. Like, why would people spend thousands of dollars? But I know people that have, and I'm like, this can't last. I just never believed it. Like, it reminds me of this, this company GoPro that went public in um, in nineteen or two thousand and like fourteen or fifteen or something like that. Remember GoPro? Yeah, everybody used to have one ahead. Exactly, everybody used to have one. So all my buddies, you know, I go on adventures around the world and stuff. But we're traveling, and they're all wearing these goofy little GoPros on their head. And they're filming everything. I'm like, who's first of all? I was like, who's going to edit all that? But anyway, um, so we're all running around with these GoPros, and they're like, Yegi, GoPro is going public. I, you know, we need to buy some. I'm like. Yeah, it's probably going to be pretty good. But what happens when Apple comes out with a waterproof case and like you can wear your Apple on your head? Like I never got GoPro and GoPro shot from like, I want to say 35 all the way up to 96, like skyrocketed. And then it crashed down to two bucks and it still hasn't recovered. And it's been what, seven, eight years. Yeah. And so, you know, you got to watch out for the fad companies. But again, you got to know when to buy and you've got to have rules for selling. So getting involved in something is awesome. You can make a ton of money. You could triple your money if you bought it, you know, right after it came public. And then you can lose a ton too if you get sucked into the hype. So just know what you're doing. I'm glad you brought the GoPro one up. That does take <laughs> that was a good a good example as well. Cause I do remember that. I, I I want a GoPro actually. I sold it. But it was pretty I remember when they first came out, it was pretty dope. Uh They're great. Especially they did a lot of uh, rock climbing and bikes. Yep bike trails and stuff like that or the canoeing the water white rafting actually yep scuba diving is great exactly yeah yeah so i like i love asking everybody this question and i feel like i get a great answer from you uh i always ask everybody what is their rich state of mind what's their big why you seem very passionate about what you're doing you've been doing it since a very young age um what's your big why well i steal from the millennials in my answer right i steal from you guys the answer for me is not the stuff that I own because I've had all the stuff, right? I've had the houses on the water and the airplanes and the boats and all that. It's about the memories you create with the people you love. That's the why for me. And then if I can, if I can just help a couple people, right? So I have this, I have this goal, right? I want to help create a thousand millionaires. Okay. Right. Yeah. I want to create a thousand millionaires. Um, I want to help create a hundred, 10 millionaires. I want to create 10 100 millionaires and one billionaire. And that means I add $4 billion 
of wealth to the planet. But I'm not just doing it because it adds wealth to the planet. I'm doing it because I want to help $4 billion worth of fun and enjoyable life and, and joy and laughter and magic moments be created on earth because that's what the money is. Like we went going back to the beginning, the money is all about what you do with it. It's not about the stuff you have because you can't take it with you. It's about the memories and the laughter and the fun that you create with the people you love. That's what I believe. Magic thank, you. Moments. thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, I, you got my mind thinking. I'm actually going to say something to you offline right after this. Uh, <laughs> I, I, and I say that because we I love your story because we talk about all the way from when you're young all the way up until now and how you've been able to mature and learn as the years go by. It wasn't like, hey, I started at 12 and I was a millionaire by 15. You know, this was a uh, learning process for you. And you've used that those experiences and the, the people that you've been around the opportunities and turned it into gold, you know, yeah. figuratively speaking, other than probably you bought some gold in your life, but you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and I like that it's relatable, it's doable, you know, and you, you have a, a your aggressive strategic uh, strategies, but then you also have your two to 4% a month strategies that also can, you know, help others as well. So you have different options that help people. And uh, I thank you so much for your time and explaining that been my pleasure absolutely really enjoyed it thank you for sticking with us from the start of the episode please share our show with friends and family visit our youtube channel and view more of our content on richstateofmind.com see you next week on the rich state of mind show